Okay, it's recording. Okay. Hi, my name is Jane Limbeck, and I have the privilege of introducing today's webinar, Disaster Relief. Today's webinar will feature a powerful practice at St. John in Moore, Oklahoma. This webinar was pre prepared by our friends at St. John's and has been being produced by Concordia University, Wisconsin's Office of Continuing and Distance Education. We thank our friends at Concordia for their leadership and support in this endeavor. I have a few notes before we begin. Live webinars are participatory events. We appreciate your questions and your comments. Feel free to express yourself by typing in the chat box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. All of the webinars presented this year are available on demand through the NLSA tab on the new looseed.org and also through the LCMS School Ministry YouTube channel. If you like what was shared, we invite you to view a recorded webinar together with your faculty as this is a great opportunity for professional development. Another great resource of Lutheran Schools is the LCMS School Ministry Facebook page. Our Facebook page provides another opportunity for our schools to connect informally. We invite you to share your encouraging stories on the LCMS School Ministry Facebook page. And so before we begin our webinar, let's um, join in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we acknowledge you as our Savior and our King and give you thanks for the opportunity to serve you in our various schools. We thank you for all of our Lutheran schools, but especially today we give you thanks for St. John, John Lutheran School. We thank you for the blessing of the school with a fantastic staff who works hard to draw children and their families into a closer relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask that you would continue to shower your blessings upon St. John. Give the staff all that they need to teach the students entrusted to their care. And finally, Lord, we ask that you be with those who are presenting this webinar, as well as those who are participating in this webinar. May this next hour be a blessing to all. In your name we pray, amen. And today we welcome Karen Craner and Stacy, who uh, will be leading our webinar. And unfortunately, Mari Happen, who has, um, has prepared a lot of uh, information in the uh, months preceding to this, has a flu today. But, uh, so we thank all three of these ladies for, uh, for sharing uh, their wealth of knowledge on disaster relief. So, um, Karen? Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you all for this opportunity for St. John's to share their story once again uh, about what happened. It's hard to believe that it has actually been five years, almost five years now, since um, that summer at St. John's. An amazing opportunity that we had to reach out to our community with the love of Jesus. So, the picture that you're seeing before you right now was taken on Friday, May 31st, 2013. It happened to be between two powerful storms that rained down on our area that evening. It was taken at approximately 4.30 in the afternoon. Considering, and you could tell how dark that sky is, but usually what 4.30 in the afternoon in the summer is for a sky that was awfully dark. Considering the record-breaking event that happened that day, I cannot look at this picture without asking the question, what does it mean to respond? Well, since I'm talking to a group of educators, um, my instinct is to turn to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, where we find three definitions. One is to say something in return, as in to respond to a question. The question on May 22nd, two days after the tornado in 2013, was how do we of St. John's Lutheran Church, Moore, Oklahoma, wish to respond to our community's devastation? To react in response, as in to respond to a cry for help, such as the mother of a child with special feeding needs who said, we need electricity during the night for his tube feeding. They want me to check him into the hospital. 
but he doesn't need a hospital. He's not sick. All we need is electricity. Do you know of any temporary housing? And the word can mean to be answerable. As in to respond to our question behavior, the question being, others treat us like beggars, you treat us like equals, why? The answer being, because God has provided for us through the generosity of his people throughout this nation. We can provide these goods and services to you, and we are all his children who through Christ's death and resurrection have been forgiven of all, so that we may one day be with him. And all that you're going through right now will pass, and through God's grace, it will get better, and we've been equipped to help. So I'd like to review with you a bit about the National Weather Service's timeline of what went on in that couple of weeks back then. First of all, we know all about the tornado that hit on the 20th, but what we don't remember sometimes is that on May 19, right before that, there was a supercell of storms that went through the area. It dropped tornadoes in the area of Edmond, Arcadia, Luther and Kearney, Norman and Lake Thunderbird, Shawnee and Prague. These are all towns and suburbs and locations that are around the Oklahoma City metro area. It's quite a wide area. Shawnee, which is about um, a, a bit northeast of Oklahoma City, received uh, the most devastating uh, damage that day from an EF4 tornado that went through. EF4 is a pretty large tornado as it is, too. And for weeks after that, we heard about an area called Bethel Acres on our news constantly that was needing help. May 20 was the EF5 tornado that touched down near Chickasha, Oklahoma, which is southwest of Oklahoma City. It crossed Interstate 44. It went through a small town called Newcastle, and then it hit Moore. And um, then it went through a little town of Little Axe on the other side of Moore. And just that area, that 17-mile path of area that went through, the tornado at that point was 1.6 miles wide. It was 17 miles on the ground. It affected the lives of 13,000 people. 24 died. Seven of them, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Seven of them were children in Plaza Towers Elementary School. And it left an estimated damage of $2 billion. It was huge. But that wasn't the end of it, because May 31st, that picture that I showed you of, of St. John's on that first slide, another EF5 went through the area. This is now the, the largest tornado that has been recorded on record. It was two and a half miles wide, and it went through the rural area to the west of Oklahoma City, outside a small town called El Reno, where it destroyed 240 homes and disrupted the lives of a lot of people who lived out in the country, a lot of the farmers out there. They didn't get a whole lot of attention because of everything that was going on with Moore. We were one of the, one of the congregations that did go out to see them. Um, actually, somebody came to our tent and told us about what was going on and we were out the next day to see them. Eventually, from this two weeks of unstable weather that hung over our state, it claimed the lives of 48 people altogether. Now, if you can see in the center of this slide, there's a young man standing in the midst of the rubble. That's my son, my son Michael, who wasn't living there at the time, but the year before, had shared a house with two other young guys there in that neighborhood. He's standing of what is in what is left of the living room of that house. What would be our response? Now is the question. On Wednesday, May 22nd, members of St. John's Lutheran Church and School, led by Reverend Mark Bershey, met as a congregation following their evening worship service 
and we put into place a plan to respond to the community's needs. We had four target areas that we identified as a response. This was, I think, a very important thing that we, we chose exactly what areas that we could respond in, what we could respond in, and we stuck to those four areas. So what you're looking at here are pictures that were taken of a whiteboard, a whiteboard in Blanchard Hall where Wendy Bershey wrote as we brainstormed that evening. We decided, as I said, on four target areas. These were, we would set up a distribution center that where of needed canned goods, tools, household supplies, spiritual support was the second one in the form of spiritual materials. And we had spiritual care teams that then traveled to the affected areas, but they also went to the hotels. The people weren't there anymore because their, their houses had been destroyed. So they were staying in all of the hotels. So the spiritual care teams would go to the hotels to, to see these people. And the third target area was summer camp scholarships. St. John's was running a summer camp program, a six week summer camp for kids when they were out of school. We had done it the year before and it had been very successful. So what we decided to do was somehow provide summer camp scholarships for children in the families who had lost all or most of their homes. And this allowed then the parents to be able to, to deal with getting the home back in order or at least getting rebuilding started, and they didn't have to worry about their kids, what were their kids during, doing during the day. The fourth target area was to have teams for, of, of volunteers to, for debris removal and eventually for rebuilding. The summer cap scholarships were funded through a generous grant from Missouri Synod. Originally, they were for 30 children, but the need grew um, within the first week, we could see that we were going to need more. So eventually the scholarships were provided for up to 60 children that could possibly attend. That was wonderful through the summer, but the amount of devastation wasn't going to go away in a couple of weeks. The school year approached and the families were in, still in the midst of recovery. The neighborhood schools, we had two neighborhood schools destroyed, Plaza Towers and Briarwood. And those two schools being destroyed, the, the parents were going to have to send their kids to other schools that would have been, you know, across town. Um, the, the district, of course, made accommodations, but their parents are, what we found was the parents wanted their kids to stay within the neighborhood. And that meant our school. So we secured additional funding from Senate and through a very generous grant from them, we were able to fund these kids staying at our school for up to three years. And when you think of the, the cost of tuition at a private school, a private Lutheran school, um, that was an amazing generous gift that we were able to supply these families. Um, as these kids came in, then Pastor Bershey, or Pastor Mark Bershey, started having group sessions with these kids and meeting with the kids one on one if they wanted it, but um, a lot of group kid, uh, group sessions. It wasn't long into the summer. I mean, he had started this right away as soon as camp started, and it wasn't long into the summer that he said to me he realized for a lot of these kids that the tornado, as devastating as it was, was just one of the storms in these children's lives. Donations poured in from all over the country and they arrived in our parking lot by trucks, by trailers, by vans, by cars. People drove up, they opened their trunks and they gave us what we needed. It was pretty amazing. My hope is that some of you that are listening to this webinar, um, I, there's a very good chance that you did something to help us out because we heard from every state in the union. We heard from so many congregations. We heard from foreign countries. And chances are somebody who is listening was part of something that helped us. And I say thank you. You, our brothers and sisters in Christ, responded.
you carpooled, you arrived to man the distribution center, you sorted donations, you made meals for workers, you assisted with debris removal, you listened to those in our company and our community as they poured out their concerns for their homes, their livelihoods, their families. It was amazing how widespread something, this sort of disaster uh, can affect, um, how widespread that, that effect can be. Things that I had never thought of. Um, yes, the, the tornado hit in Moore, but people worked in Moore and didn't necessarily live there but the where they worked was destroyed. So now what happens to their jobs? Um, it was it was very interesting. Um, over 10,000 volunteer hours were clocked through St. John's between May 21st and August 5th. That was just the summer. There were quilts that were given to our community. Over 500 quilts came in from all over the country from from groups that had been making them. We had over a thousand families that came through the distribution center. Some of them came more than once as their needs changed. Each family that came through received a spiritual care kit through that tent. And the spiritual care teams would then, again, we, they would go into the community, they go to the hotels, everywhere they would, they would go, they would offer these spiritual care kits to them, made sure that they had that. And then um, also they would offer financial assistance because that was another thing that we had was um, monetary donations that had come in. We set up a committee of four uh, trusted Christian men in our congregation to oversee that. And we were able to go to families then and um, offer them this financial help to get back on their feet. Volunteers came from all over the United States. Many returned as often as they could. We never had to ask for help. People just came. It was, it was so amazing how God's people just poured out the, the help to us. We worked closely with Lutheran Church Charities to organize teams of volunteers. We continue to work with Lutheran Church Charities as needed. Um, even five years later, there are still things that are going on that are needed. Um, most of the the building and rebuilding that we assisted with happened within the first two to three years, but it was just last year that a family in our congregation finally got a settlement with their insurance company so that they could rebuild. So this all goes on. It continues. Um, by the end of the year, by the end of 2013, we had surpassed 20,000 volunteer hours. Um, of, of doing the things that we did in the community. One ministry that arrived in Moore two days after the May 20 tornado and that remained local over the course of several weeks was the Lutheran Church Charities Comfort Dog Ministry. These animals are amazing. These canine ambassadors for the gospel brought relief of anxiety to everyone whose paths they crossed, but they were especially helpful when it came to the children. This was an amazing thing that we found. Um, the children, if they had trouble expressing themselves as to what had, had happened to them, when the words failed them, here were the comfort dogs. The comfort dogs allow the children to embrace them. They pet them, they stroke them, um, they, they, just by embracing them, it was a wonderful calming effect for these children. And then, they would open up and they would start to talk. And um, the staff of St. John's learned to me that the children would react to the dog so much better than they would to a human. Pastor Bershey put it this way, humans mean well, but the dog is asking for nothing. The dog just wants to be loved. So he estimated that, he estimated that those, those comfort dogs, that was the number one tool for reaching the children. Prayer happened constantly for us. I would often get phone calls from pastors all over the nation. They would ask how we, they could help us, and then they would end it with prayer. Phone calls came from others around the nations, and when we finished discussing what they could do, they would say, we're praying for you. What you're looking at in this um, picture is this wonderful uh, banner that was made 
um, from a preschool, by a preschool in Manhattan, Kansas. And all those hands are those little children that are praying for us. Enrollment in St. John's summer camp allowed those children affected by the tornado to receive group counseling from Reverend Mark Bershey. Almost daily through the summer of 2013, he spoke with the children in a group setting. Chosen because the children seemed to speak more freely in a group than in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And he, he really stressed he thought that was very important, that, that he recognized that early on. Um, how they opened up more in a group because what would happen was these children came from a variety of circumstances when it came to that tornado. When the tornado hit, they were in so many different places. Some of them were in the midst of the tornado. Some of them were miles away from the tornado. Some of them, it was no big deal because it was no different from something that you saw on TV. But for others, it was up close and personal. And there were just lots of different levels of trauma for these children. If you spoke to a child one-on-one -on -one concerning specifically the tornado, he sensed fear in the child. But in a group, that same child would hear from another child who experienced a similar fear. Realizing that he or she had experienced the same emotions, that's what helped the child's anxieties to lessen and more sharing would occur, and the fears seemed to subside. So he really, he really stressed the idea of the group um, therapy, or the group counseling for these kids. What have we learned from this experience, the way we responded, and what does it mean for our practices going forward? So due to the needs of the community, one of the things that, that we did, it, it wasn't just the community as well as the school, it was decided for that time that we would have additional pastoral care, um, that that would benefit St. John's. So in the spring of 2014, almost a year after the tornado, Reverend Blaise Marin, who was graduating from uh, Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, he accepted the call that we put out and he began his work with the children of St. John's. With additional spiritual care at the school, they had they set up an office within the school for the two pastors to be there. Um, they were usually there in the mornings, but with the two of them, then they could do some trading off. Being there in the mornings, then having somebody there all the time gave the children more access to the two pastors. This was important because even though it was almost a year later, the children continued to experience anxiety with every meteorological event that went through our community. And almost this year later, we were back then again into the tornado season. So these kids were going to be hearing about this. These kids were going to be seeing this on television if hopefully these kids wouldn't be through it again. So those anxieties were still there. The second thing that the school uh, did was review policies that they had for responding to any kind of disasters or emergency situations in the school. And they decided to, uh, that they needed to review these, review all of these, how they implemented this. So out of that came this one policy that they have where they formed class emergency kits. These class emergency kits accompany all the children wherever they go on campus, and when they're on field trips, it travels with them. A student is designated to carry the emergency kit and it goes with them even just from room to room, room to cafeteria, room to playground. Then it goes on field trips, it goes everywhere. So in this kit has the emergency information on each student. It has the identification on each student's designated driver, the class roster, first aid, and a flashlight. Each teacher that's on staff there carries a radio to maintain contact with other school personnel. They always have this radio with them. Should a need occur, each teacher has at his or her fingertips important information and equipment. The designated student, like I said, carries it with them all the time. It goes with them everywhere. We have safe rooms in the school. We have, we've had this, I mean, even before, we have four 
areas that are designated um, safe rooms uh, to protect from major storms. These safe rooms are always equipped with weather radios, bottled water, emergency snacks, flashlights, and first aid. During and in the aftermath of a tornado, the staff are well equipped to handle physical and emotional needs of the children. <clears throat> As with many schools, the staff and the students practice safety drills for tornado and fire on a regular basis. But we've started another one. Beginning in the fall of 2015, we added a, an earthquake drill. Um, in Oklahoma, we've had some shaking going on in the last few years. Nothing major, well, depends on, I guess, who you are, difference between major and minor depends on who owns it, I suppose. But um, we have had this shaking that has started. So um, the LCMS Oklahoma District Disaster Response uh, Team started putting together resources for what's called the Great Shakeout. You can find out about the Great Shakeout at shakeout.org. But it's, a, um, it's basically it's set up by the government to provide people with information on how to respond to earthquakes and how to prepare for them. St. John's practices an earthquake drill each October. It's an event that's carried out by, it's, it's actually called the Great Shakeout, and different parts of the country do it at different times. Central United States happens to be designated October. What's neat is you can go online there, and um, they have resources for all kinds of different organizations. And you can find at shakeout.org resources for faith-based organizations. So um, we, uh, the, 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 I serve on the D disaster response committee, so I may refer to, my, refer to this as we, but um, the district disaster response team then adapted those resources that were on uh, shakeout.org for faith-based um, organizations adapted that for our Lutheran congregations and our Lutheran schools that are in our state. One adaptation was the inclusion of devotions to be used both following the drill and in the event of an actual earthquake. Other resources in there will be, um, we, we have uh, um, the drill itself, the directions for the drill, and um, then these devotions, plus a letter that goes home to the parents letting them know that their children practiced this drill that day. <clears throat> the LCMS Oklahoma District has been equipped now with their own LCC comfort dog. This was another change that we made. Um, Rufus Comfort Dog lives with Reverend Mark Erler and his family of St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Edmond, Oklahoma. Edmond is north of Oklahoma City. But Rufus serves all of the district, plus he's been to Texas um, and to respond down there to things that have happened. So he's around. Rufus is available. The Comfort Dog Ministry stresses having these dogs out in the public on a regular basis. He will go to hospitals. Um, he's been to nursing homes, universities. He's been to other agencies. They call upon Rufus. Any, everybody knows they can call upon Rufus to come and attend events or just visit any time. And so quite often, Rufus has been to the school to visit the kids. Um, and so his presence is, is well welcomed there. Um, but this is bringing Rufus into the school on occasion has helped these children with not just the, the what happened with the tornadoes, but um, all along any other storms that have happened since then. Oops, sorry. Finally, Reverend Bershe advises pastors who may find themselves in a disaster situation to be flexible. No two children, he says, are going to act exactly alike. No two children are going to handle it the same. When I asked him about this, he added, you can't go wrong pushing Jesus, that's what we do. What better comfort is there? A larger challenge, he said, was serving families whose children had actually died in the storm. 
In those cases, his advice to others is to listen more than talk, giving the comfort of Jesus with the words given by God at the time. The original length of time estimated by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for the area of more to recover from that tornado was five years. By the grace of God, the reality of this length of time seems shorter. Hospitals, businesses, and schools that were destroyed were up and running within 18 months. In neighborhoods where few houses were left standing, new homes have been built. Families are returning, have, they have returned to the area. Through it all, St. John's Lutheran Church and School has been blessed to be a spiritual foundation for the children who may speak of those days for years to come. Because you see, what you're looking at right now is what our hospital looked like on May 29th, one week after the tornado. And here's what it looks like today. It, uh, this picture was taken on August 1, 2017. They were actually up and running. I think it was, um, it was within 16 months. They opened 16 months after the tornado on the same grounds. This is what it looked like in the Plaza Towers subdivision one week after the tornado. And here's how it looks today. There are new houses, green grass, streets that had lots of potholes put in them because of all the trucks that had to drive through and haul out all that debris. All those streets have been repaved. This is what Plaza Towers Elementary School looked like on May 29th. And what you see is just the bare ground and a car that was smashed in the tornado that is still sitting there. That what you're looking at would have been the drive up to the front of the school. If you look in the, in the other picture with the animals around there, anyone out there who, who views this who may recognize um, that is hanging in the middle of that fence is the LWML bear, Peoria Penny. Peoria Penny was uh, a bear that I, one of my bears, and I decided to leave it there on the fence there. So Peoria Penny decided to hang around there and oversee everything. This is Plaza Towers today. And as you can tell from the marquee up there in the corner, talking about parents coming in and all, it's business as usual. It is really a very beautiful new school that they put up. And um, they... Uh, have a, a whole wall of, of memory in memory of the, the children that lost their lives there. Um, but they have really made a beautiful new school out of there. This is what was left of a shopping center that was on 149th Street. I don't know if you can really tell, but you can if you if you look closely in that picture you can see the 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 ground behind the building through the open walls and the marquee was blown out and all. But today that's back and businesses are open. The trees, something that just really amazed me, but the trees were totally stripped of all signs of life on May 20. But homes are back and the trees are yielding new life all around. And whole neighborhoods have returned. And our other school, this is Briarwood, which was also totally destroyed. Briarwood stands proudly surrounded by barren fields, but it is open for business and was open for business. Both of the schools were back, I want to say it was by um, 2015. So in closing, I will say I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers, Ephesians 1.16. Because of your faithful service, everybody out there, 
Moore continues to recover. The members of St. John's and the community of Moore thank you for sharing your time, talent, and gifts, and for continuing to do so as we continue to recover. But we're not done. Indeed, of disaster relief may never be done. We need to be prepared, and we need to be ready. We can never be sure when or where the next disaster will strike. But what we do know, and of this we can be sure, is Isaiah 41.10. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always to the end of the age. To God be the glory. Great things he has done. And to, to God be the glory for all that he will continue to do. Thank you. And now if anyone has any questions or anything, I'll be glad to entertain those. Karen, I can tell that you're still very passionate and uh, <laughs> brings back a lot of memories for you. Uh, even yeah, I didn't. Say five minutes, five years later. I didn't think I was going to be that emotional. I must apologize. <laughs> no problem. Um, I can understand why it would be an emotional event. So, um, so I thank you for sharing um, your story and the things that you've learned. From that, it will be a, it's a valuable um, tool for all of us to really kind of consider what would happen if a disaster came um, in our communities and impacted us in the same way. Are we really prepared for that? So we thank you. For yeah, that. I th I think that um, I you know I since the more tornado, um, I got involved with um, with the district level disaster response that is coordinated by Pastor Ron Simpson and I must say it surprises me still how we, we tend to have this idea that it's going to happen to someone else and until more I don't think we really woke up and, and realized just what all can happen to us you know um, so we work with the disaster response we try to inform congregations and schools to, to be prepared. And I think that St. John's, because we went through this, because you know we, we witnessed this, um, it really brought it home. And so many of us, um, the, the next year, I think it was the next year, um, I, no, actually it was two years down the road. In 2015, spring of 2015, we had a smaller tornado that went through practically the same area, almost the exact same area. It was very close to it. It was it was like an F1, F2 tornado. It didn't do a lot of damage, but it just did enough to really shake everyone up. And what surprised me was that um, compared to how things happened when the tornado went through in 2013, within 24 hours, um, we knew where everybody was in our congregation and we knew um, the condition of anything around the church. We knew who had damage, who didn't. And the reason why was because we had put into place a system where we could contact everybody right away. We used Facebook to get out there, um, a Facebook page to say if you've had any damage or if anybody's hurt, contact us. Um, it just, once it happens to you, I think it makes you really sit up and watch and listen and rethink what you're doing, and especially with the children in the school, especially there, knowing who had who what what information you really need, knowing who it is that's picking up everybody. Of course, we go through those practices already with with our schools. We do have those systems in place, but to when you, when something to to really sit back and examine your policies and think, what would we do in this situation? Are we fully prepared for that? And thinking through, you know, anyone can go to, um, uh, through, through on the internet to any different websites. The LCMS 
has a disaster response uh, mission. And on that portion of the website, there are all sorts of resources listed as to what people can do. And um, if anything, you know, just going there and researching and thinking of all the different kinds of things that could happen in your area. And do you really have those plans in place? Are you really prepared? It may never happen, but if, but at least if you're prepared, um, you're ready. You're you're ready for it, and those kids are going to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sort of like having an AD in your building. You you have it just to be prepared, but you hope you never have to use it. So absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. so. Are there any other comments from any others that are um, listening right now? So Karen, I would again thank you for um, your time and uh, Karen, Stacy, and Mari for all of the work that you've done in preparing for this webinar. We really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so we also want to say thanks to our friends from Concordia, Wisconsin for their help in producing this webinar. The next Powerful Practice webinar is scheduled for April the 10th and we'll be highlighting the Powerful Practice from Ascension in Fort Wayne, Indiana, on teaching the faith through church, school, and family. So be looking for more information on this webinar and other upcoming webinars in the near future. God's blessings to you all as you continue to serve our Savior as professional educators in our Lutheran schools. Have a great day. Thank you, Sean.